<laughs> I stayed up far too long last night, but I'll try to pull this up. Okay, good morning everyone. Welcome to the second day of DeepSec number nine. Uh, now the first presentation that will hopefully wake you up is from Johnny Deutsch and have we penetrated yet? It's more about the relationship between us, the techie guys that penetrate systems and our clients, what we think, what they think, and why things don't work out between each other so easily. Enjoy. So good morning, everybody. Starting the timer. So um, it's very early, not a lot of people in, in the room, so I hope that people will join as we, we start. My name is Johnny, Johnny Deutsch. Uh, I'm from the US, or Israel, it depends how you look at it. You'll see that in a second. Um, and I'm here to talk about something which is not necessarily technical, but everybody that is, has been around in this field knows what I'm talking about, and you know, I'll help clear up some certain things. So we'll start with the basic intros of who am I, why am I talking about this. We'll start talking about penetration testing. You know, the types that we normally see, the types that we have in this world. Um, we'll talk about one of the main things is that how do we perceive the problem and how does the client perceive the problem? A lot of the times we see that there's just a, you know, a, a mistranslation between us and the client. Uh, it's not because we're bad and he's good or something like that. It's just like, you know, two people seeing different problems. And then we'll go and talk about the challenges, you know, that we have and that the client has, which we'll try to understand why is it that we see the problem in a different way. And then we'll talk about client interactions. Um, that's the funny bit. Th these are the, the real, I mean, pearls that I believe that I have, or you know, I've been doing this for 10 years, and I think that I've seen these, these situations that you as a professional or a provider could automatically talk to the client and say, hey, you know, let's start with these things. Once we get the conversation going with these things, things tend to run smoothly. So who am I? A bit about me. I used to be a captain in the Israeli intelligence forces doing cyber warfare and cyber intelligence. Um, over seven years have passed and uh, I was a deputy CISO of the Ministry of Defense. A lot of nice stuff, but you know, it's all in the past. Um, I, I went into civil life with Ernest & Young. Ernest & Young acquired an Israeli startup called Hactics, Hacking Tactics. We were a boutique company doing penetration testing on application level testing. Um, and we were assimilated into Ernest & Young consulting business. I have recently moved to Ernest & Young's um, center in the US. I reside in Houston, Texas. Uh, that's where we have all of our consulting business for IT security. I've been speaking about security in a lot of different uh, uh, conferences for a long time. So yeah, let's begin. So what is pen testing? You know, it's kind of funny. I think that even t even uh, starting with this funny quote is is it is all qu it is funny. But you know, when people say pen testing, you know, people think a lot of different things. So of course, we're not actually testing pens, uh, granted. But then again, you might have clients thinking, okay, I don't exactly know what are these guys doing. Um, so just to try and clear up what is pen testing, that's what we're going to talk about today. So, why am I really having this talk? because most security conferences are geared towards technical things. Well, that's because we don't really have relationship conferences when it comes to the security world. So we have to pull it in into a technical talk and try to explain the problems that we have in this specific and complex relationship that we have. We are service providers, we are clients, we're client service providers, depending on how you define yourself, you might run into this situation. The problem being is that not everybody sees the problem the same way, and it's not really a problem. As we'll talk about, it's more of a challenge, you know? Not everything is the way it looks. So I hope that I can help you understand why am I saying the things that I'm saying, or why are you saying the things that you are saying to your client, or to the service provider that is providing you the service, specifically of pen testing. So let's start with the most basic definition of what is included when we say pen testing. So not to misrepresent, I've put the good, the bad, and the ugly, 
Not because I like the movie, but because in a way, it is a funny way to group the various types of pen testing that we have. So, not saying that one is good, one is bad, or one is ugly, let's start with the ugly. Uh, let's talk about compliance testing. So, in a pen tester's worst day, he wakes up and he has a PCI pen test. There's no problem with PCI, I mean, there is, but there isn't a specific problem with, with PCI, rather the fact that when pen testers do a PCI or a compliance towards uh, uh, testing, they're geared towards finding specific findings. The client isn't always, you know, as interested in finding everything, or it's not that he's not interested, it's not the work that you're supposed to do. You're supposed to find very specific findings that correlate to the checklist that is supporting the client in that specific assessment. It's not very vague, but that's exactly how the pen tester feels. So the pen tester, which is, you know, if, if you're a pen tester, you know you are a free thinker. You want to save the world in your own way. You want to find the bad stuff that make things bad and fix them or help people understand why are they like that and help them fix it. When you start with compliance testing, you start fixing someone's specific problem. 1.2, specifically, a section within a problem. So you don't really get to fix your own stuff. So a lot of the problems that we're having when it comes to compliance testing is due to the fact that pen testers, those free thinkers, don't really like compliance testing because they like to fix stuff. Whereas compliance is more, you know, being regulated and it's being compliance with, compliant with something. Something that we know pen testers are not exactly big on because we're kind of different. Then we have, in a way, a bad thing. We have the focus testing. So you could say it's bad, you could say it's not. But everything left to its own is kind of bad because when you don't really see the broad picture and when you just see one specific thing, that could result in a bad thing. So that group is the focus testing. It's that time of day that somebody tells you, I want you to test a specific subsection of a specific application. And you know that you'll find a lot of stuff in that application, and it might actually go and you know, reside in a bigger program, but you don't really see the big picture. You see a specific sub-program within a giant complex system, and you always say, yeah, but a real attacker doesn't really care about this specific software, he cares about the broad issue, the broad system. So you might have a very frustrated pen tester saying, hey, the client is telling me just look straight, like a horse, look straight, do not look right, do not look like, there's nothing, there's no other applications to the right, no other applications to the left, just go and charge on that one. Where, you know, where pen testers don't really, they're not made out of these same materials of not looking to the right or to the left. You hire us to look to the right and look to the left just telling us to go forward. It's not exactly the best use of our time, but we'll talk about it. But that's the type of testing that we're talking about. Go and find a specific problem with a specific device. With embedded testing, you're not looking at the whole environment. You don't know specifically what goes on with the environment. Go look at an infrastructure. Sometimes infrastructure is an environment, sometimes it's a sub-infrastructure, so it really depends. The good is the hybrid testing. So the hybrid testing, goes to the real attack scenarios. What will, an, what will an attacker be able to do in a red team kind of environment? You know, he's, your client is his target. No matter how, he needs to get in. And it doesn't, like the client doesn't really care, and you don't really care as a pen tester. I mean, you do, you care about how you'll get in, but you don't really care about what are the means that you will use to get into that specific environment. I tend to look at this as the good, not because it's only freedom of thought for the pen tester and you're actually using him for what he's good for, but it's good for you because you get to see what a real world attacker faced with a problem which, you know, or a challenge which is your network or your organization would have done. So sometimes overmanaging this kind of process is bad. So letting the attackers have the, the, the run at it is the good thing. Same goes for social engineering which we, you know, we tend to say when it comes to spear phishing attacks, sorry, and things of that sort, uh, which simulate real world attacks, like we have nowadays. Process controls are a specific subgroup that I like to put in the hybrid testing 
because there's no real thing that is called process control. It is one giant system that we test the whole system. Again, according to your methodology, according to how you do it, but you are supposed to check the entire environment, where it resides physically, cyber and wise, and everything that, around, that is around it. So in a way, I have grouped everything that we call pen testing. Some would say that there are other categories to be added here, but you know, this is a very general uh, uh, generalization of what we call pen testing. One specific thing that I always like to say, people look at a lot of different things and say, okay, it's roughly the same. If I have one thing that I want you to, to leave this room with, is that there's one major difference in the world of pen testing, and that is application security. It's not, I'm not boasting or anything, but I've seen a lot of stuff. There are a lot of good infrastructure pen testers. It is a commoditized world, and I'm not saying it's simple, but it's, it's something that you learn more, with more ease. Application security is hard. It's hard because not all applications are born equal. Whereas infrastructures, they are, they are kind of born equal. They are a subset of giant companies that have just put you know, their devices onto your organization and you have structured it. So the recommendations that I will most likely provide, me and any other company in the world would most likely be very similar. Application security, on the other hand, is completely different. It's up to the developer to develop the application. Now I need to, in the art of dismantling this giant thing, break it and understand why it broke. And once I understood why it broke, I need to understand how to fix it. So just you know, think of the process that is just almost so, sometimes insurmountable. How do you do that? How do you have a person, which is not mostly a developer, because pen testers don't tend to be developers. They have some understanding in development, but they're not developers. So they're supposed to understand how to reverse it, how to break it, and then how to fix it. Like, what would have prevented them? Because sometimes you just get into somewhere and you don't really know what happened. You're in, you're in the system, but you have no idea what happened in the back end. You know, a lot of, a lot of blind injections that you, you supposedly know what you've done, but you're not 100% sure. So please keep that in mind. Well, you're, you know, if you're a service consumer, service provider, always think of application security just a bit differently. Okay? <clears throat> now we'll talk about why is there such a difference between us and the client. So, you know, these funny pictures where you see what do I think I do, what do my parents think I do, and what my friends think I do. So that, that is the equivalent in a way. So, when do we normally want to get called? If I'm a pen tester or I manage a group of pen testers, when would I like to be called versus when do I really get called, okay? So one of the, fir the first things that uh, we normally get called on are, are one-offs. The client has a specific application and he wants us to, te to, to test specifically that application. That or a five or 10 or 20 of specific applications of a specific group. Whereas we normally want to be a strategic decision. We want to go with you guys all the time that we test these kinds of applications. Subgroups, language-wise, whatever you decide, you make your own decision. We're not involved in that decision. But don't call me because you just want a pen testing company. It's just not good practice. And we'll talk about it in a few minutes. Why isn't it really good practice to do these kind of things? Post-breach, something happened. And you need to do something. Pen testing is usually Something. It's not that we don't like it, we understand the reality, but, you know, nobody wants to get called after somebody, somebody missed something and then you're supposed to clean something that, you know, you're not actually cleaning. So, we don't like it, we get called, we understand it, but it's something that you need to think about as well. Am I saying to stop this? No, never. <laughs> Keep calling us, but understand that it's probably trying, trying to do something beforehand will help you better. You know, seeing it before is something that is uh, well known. And something that is very, I don't know, maybe it's, it's very specific to the US. The cyber, uh, sorry, the board has started talking about cyber. 
So uh, the SEC has a lot of regulations out, a lot too, um, that have stirred a lot of uh, debates within uh, boards of companies. So board members don't really, you know, they're not exactly technical people, but they want to understand what is it that we're doing about cyber. What is cyber? We're not exactly sure about cyber, but we know that we need to do something about it. Pen testing is one of the things that we probably would like to do something about it, because if you'll start to explain the SDLC process to a board member, it is just impossible. But if you say, we have hackers that are working for us, and they're trying to penetrate or break our systems, you don't need to have a computer science degree, you understand that. So it's a, it's, it's a good thing as a board member, and you can understand that. Do we like it? Well, you know, it's just like calling a normal chef which is specifically a pastry chef, you just call him a chef. Yeah, we do cyber. That's, that's true. Well, nobody likes the fact that you're calling us for this specific reason, but hey, we'll come. That's okay. Um, or you're trying to do something new. Or when I say do something new, you're trying to go into the cloud. Or you just basically found out that your whole company is in the cloud and you just want us to understand what exactly is the cloud. Can we break the cloud? And can we get it over to you? Again, not bad, but it's just not a strategic decision. It's not that you have decided to, it's probably you found out that you have done so. Um, when do we also want to get in? We want to get in when you know the process that is behind the problem. Do you understand the business? We'll talk about what is understanding the business. What are the risks that you're actually facing? And what is it that you really want us to test? Surprisingly so, not a lot of clients know. I'm, and, you know, that's the way the world works now. So when we look, when we look at the challenge, we have a much simpler challenge. Uh, as a pen tester, we just care that we have the right people with the right skill set, that the timing fits the budget. Okay, we have the right testers at the right time, with the right skill set, and the right budget from the client. It's very simple. In a way, very, very simple. The client has a lot more challenges. So, you know, I'm not saying the whole problem is with us or with the client. I think we're, we're equal in that. So the client has the business, the, the business concerns. He's not really mostly responsible for the things that we're testing. And we are aware of that. So when you think that you're, you're coming into a company and you're saying, hey, bring me all your stuff, that client does not really know or not always knows what is all the stuff that you're asking. It's not under his responsibility. He has his own leadership that needs to be able to tell him what to do and then what he understands what he needs to do and he needs to balance these things. We normally don't have that challenge. We're just told, hey, go and help serve this client. I mean, sometimes we have extra challenges, but you know, not that much. And then, of course, there's the timing. You remember the fact that it's not his own application. It's not his own infrastructure. It's someone else. He needs to coordinate. So we understand that sometimes these people are very technical people, and they become miniature project managers, which they don't really like, which nobody really likes. Um, so it's a challenge on their end. Moreover, they need to balance the need. Do we really need to use them that much? Uh, it's a cost-benefit kind of thing, okay? Um, he, that specific client needs to manage that just as much. So now let's move on to what I call client interactions. So the reason why, one of the, one of the things that got me thinking about this is that in EY we have workshops to understand the clients. So I was thinking, you know, let's talk with pen testers. What are the challenges as pen testers? And that's not, it has nothing to do with EY. It's just everybody that is in, in the business can understand that. So I said, let's mock up a few interactions that we know that, oh, that's a bad projector, that we know that the client has, or we have, and let's try to analyze them. So the first thing, black boxing you. So as you know, you know, you can either black, gray, or white box a pen test. Not knowing, knowing something, knowing everything. Ideally, or ideally for every client, when you offer him up the options, he says, yeah, let's go with black box. Or I want to know how attackers will approach this. Which is, which is right, okay? 
But then, yeah, but I don't exactly have the budget for it. So let's try and put a black box approach in, you know, kind of a gray box budget. So you have a lot of problems with it because you're saying, okay, but we really need to be able to spend more time on the reconnaissance part. We don't really know what is it that you want us to get. We don't really know the infrastructure. We don't know a lot, or we don't know anything at all. Another main, frame, main thing is that black boxing works in very specific manners. And what, am I, what do I mean? Do you remember when I said that we can get called for the one-offs, the one application that we're testing? Well, it's very hard to do black boxing on a single application. You don't really know what is it that you're specifically testing, okay? That's why Red Team is a great way to do a black box, because in Red Team, you don't know a lot about your organization, okay? You just, you're told, hey, this is me, client name, go and get this stuff. That's okay, we can work black box. But if you're saying, hey, this is me, client name, I have a specific application under my SAP model that I want you to attack specifically. I will not tell you anything about it. Go and attack that one. That's kind of hard. That's, I, I wouldn't say hard, but it, it does not fit reality because a real attacker does not really say, hey, <laughs> yeah, I've known you for many years from the media. I know you have an SAP system. I want to go into this specific models and I don't want to know anything else. It's, it's not real life. Real life doesn't work like that. So attackers don't really do that. So that's the time where we talk about gray boxing. We have the challenge, you have the challenge. Probably if you'll reveal more, it is you know, the middle ground in which we will meet. Um, it's not a one answer fits all. I'm not saying that everything needs to be gray boxed, but it's, it's, it's kind of our mistake as an industry a lot of the time that we don't always uh, customize the options to the right environment. Because, you know, we start to have a discussion with the client, and you tell him, hey, how do you want to go at it? And he says, what do you mean? And, you know, nobody wants to have a silent conversation, and you say, do you want a black box, a gray box, or a white box? Because that's your script that you're used to say. And then the client says, yes, black box sounds really good. Okay, and then you go with the flow. Um, but you have to adjust it. So just as, as we understand that, client understands that, we'll, we'll understand that as we go along. Again, not one to rule them all, but we have to find a middle ground here. Second, what do we test? It's like the, I think it's the second or even the first thing. Do we do it in the development environment? I mean, is it good to test the development environment? Are we normally doing that? Or, or then, you know, once you say, okay, let's do the production environment, then the client says, well, careful, it might break. And if it breaks, you know, I don't really have responsibility over it. So says, but you're asking us to test it. So it's our responsibility? So we don't really know. So we get a lot of, you know, we can test, you can test the production, sorry, you can, pr you can test the development, but in real production environment, it's kind of different. So you're like, okay, it's kind of different, then it would be a kind of different attack in the real world, and what will our report say? You know, uh, do we want to test just that, or do you want us to test the real environment? And I wouldn't say that there is a good answer or a one answer, because again, it's an interaction between human beings. There's never, you know, a one answer, and every company is very different, but, I would say that if you have a staging environment, which is normally the environment where you roll out your stuff before it goes into production, that's a good environment to start with. Granted, not a lot of, company have stage, a lot of companies have staging environments. So you still have to make that specific wise decision of what specific environment do you want to test. But please be cognizant of the fact that you need to think of this before you even talk to a pen tester. Before you, you start to talk to us, you need to realize where will you be testing this? Because in pen tests, things break. We break stuff, that's what you're paying us for. 
So please be aware of that. Just think about it. You know, even 10 minutes before you give us a call, you'll have that answer, you know, instead of just coming up with it during our call. Another thing. I want you guys to test it for big question mark. What exactly is it that you're wanting us to test? Um, so can you give us like the scenario, you can, can you guys give us the scenario that you guys want to attack? What do you mean? You're, you're the client. Please tell us what is it that you want us to do. I mean, we will attack, but attack is very broad. Let's talk about the processes. What is the specific process that you want us to find or to manipulate and things of that sort? Uh, well, you know, not, not a lot of clients would specifically know what to tell you. Um, so you have to be very specific on how exactly you got the findings that you got. Where you think that it's something that a client will be very much aware of and will know, you know, what is the specific issue, but sometimes people just don't think about it because you think of an application as an application and not as an application that actually supports a process. You know, we tend to be technical people. We just think of, well, what is the infrastructure that is lying on? What is the specific development language that was written on? Who, who develops it? You know, who's the team that supports it? And things of that sort. Wherever we don't really think of, yeah, but what's, what's like the business cause? What is it doing? Like, if an attacker would want to do something, what would it look like? Because we're not talking about the vulnerabilities here. We're talking about the logical, the logical flaw that will make that vulnerability something great, that will make it and turn it into an actual risk or a threat to the company. So maybe because you know, I come from a company that does a lot of risk management, um, we tend to sometimes work with the operational risks guys. So if you don't know who are the operational risks within your company, um, they're not the, you know, the most interesting people that you would most likely find. Um, but they are pen testers and fought. But they never know, they, they've never heard of the, the fact that there is the thing called pen testing. So what do I mean? So you have people within companies that try to understand what are the business processes that each and every main process in your company supports. They would go and map the supply chain. Who are you reliant on? What are the processes that are built within that supply chain? How do you support it? They would go into your business applications. You know, if you're a bank, they would go in and map out the, uh, the every processes that a human being, that a teller, you know, works on and supports. What they don't a lot of times do, they don't go into the applications specifically, but sometimes they mention the applications. So you could see within a banking environment, a financial environment, uh, uh, these specific operational risk guys describing a specific application and what usages or misusages would the employee or a client of the company make use of? And what will the risk will be, that will be in the result of that misusage? So it is a very good practice just to take these specific, uh, these specific people have a sit down with them and explain to them about the process that you're specifically performing. And just say, hey, um, you know, I'm testing this app. I want you to tell me what can go wrong with this app. And they would just tell you, hey, you know, an employee can do this, 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 and that. Take this data, go to the pen tester. I want you to simulate these following scenarios. When you have that, you really need to have a pen tester. Because then a pen tester would go, ah, oh, okay, now I understand what is it that I need to break and how do I need to break it exactly. Because just finding an XSS is not exactly you know, what, what he gets up to. He wants to, he wants to be able to break the system in a way that you know, the client will understand that, hey, it's really broken. Look at the business process that, you know, that flows underneath it. So start with these people. Which leads me to, to our last interaction, which is, I want you guys to find it all, everything. It's a very, very, very broad statement. What is everything? You want us to find who can do what, like the threat actors? You want us to find something that you could have found in an automated tools as well? 
or what is it exactly that you, you want to do? So, first of all, like I said, separate the logical flaws from the actual vulnerabilities. For a logical flaw, they have still not invented the software that could find it. You need an actual human being to understand that there is logic behind this specific process and I can break it by doing this. For a vulnerability to find an XSS, you can use a tool. As pen testers, or as well aware or well informed pen testers, we will not be afraid of those tools. I am not afraid from the day that the fortifies of this world would replace us, okay? Because everybody using automation needs to know how to use automation and what automation does and what it doesn't do. And human beings will always, in a way, be able to fill that what doesn't it do. So, as clients, don't be afraid of using it. Don't think of it as something that is misusage of our time. And as pen testers, don't think that once clients will start get, you know, start to do these things, your uh, your profession will, will disappear. It will never be the case, or not in the le the next three years. Um, perform threat assessment. Please understand who can do what. Okay. Uh, it's not a threat intelligence talk. I can, I can give threat intelligence talks as an ex-intelligence officer, but uh, please be cognizant of who can threaten you. Application level attacks have very few, or very few, sorry, very many levels that you just need to classify and understand who is a relevant threat to you. It could, co it could come specifically within the framework of the code that your, your uh, developers are developing, or it could be just, you know, uh, the most superficial uh, application of vulnerability or even in an infrastructure vulnerability kind of assessment. So please be aware of who's attacking you and then tell the pen testers, you know, we're afraid of a nation state. So, okay, you'll see the pen tester in a paranoid mode. Okay, what is a nation state capability? And you'll start to reverse everything in your environment. Last thing, let's have three minute SQL injections coming from a specific application that is developed by a specific team, you have a training problem here. So take that information, translate what we give you with our report into metrics, whatever metrics that you can. If it's training, if it's quality of development, take it and build it into something better, something bigger. That's the only stuff that I had, the main issues that I always see coming up from pen tests. And that's, these are the, uh, I think, words of wisdom that I could help you with. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd love to, have to, to answer them. Thanks. Thank you for your talk. Um, it seems that sometimes business and uh, the testers are not on the same page. Do you think it's a kind of a lack of knowledge on business, understanding IT, security, and whatever? Or is it like the testers do not understand business and uh, cannot talk in a language that they understand what it's actually about? I think it's a, it's a very healthy or unhealthy mix of both. Uh, you have pen testers that think that they're above the business. We can break everything, therefore we can, you know, we know everything. But, you know, it's, it's a very juvenile way of thought, you know, because if you're from your own business, you know the business best. So a pen tester can tell you that this XSS is a persistent one, and it's, you know, finding a persistent one is like the worst kind of thing. But you as a business know, hey, this is not even in a client-facing kind of web page. It's not a part of my business process. It's very bad as a vulnerability, but it's not that bad for the business. So... As the, uh, if you're coming from, a, from like the client side, you need to make that consideration because a pen tester's job, in a way, is to be the most dr dramatic person in the room. I found this most amazing thing. You need to be the one leveling him out and saying, okay, why do you think it's the most amazing thing? So it's not the bum is out, but you know, just to, to be able to bring us down to reality sometimes. I have a problem with my clients on uh, forensics. Uh, not so much a bit in audit, but 
always in forensics, they want to know who is the guy who didn't uh, lock the computer when you make a, a social engineering audit, who is the guy who forgot uh, the badge or the mobile phone, who is the guy who didn't... I want to fire him. Take, yeah. <laughs> I want to fire him, but I don't want a poor guy uh, poor guy be fired just because the day I was here, he didn't lock his computer. This guy maybe just need training and not, uh, and not uh, be fired. So what about ethics? What is your opinion on this? And uh, second question, when I go back to clients uh, after risk analysis, after audits, they make some plans, we will put this budget, we will do these actions, and three, days, three months, six months after you come back and nothing is done. And did you saw in companies your, your testing, uh, same vulnerabilities years and years after? after. Yeah, so for the first, for the first question, um, in each of, you know, like for example in our report, one of the things that we have that a lot of times just, you know, repeat themselves is strategic recommendations. The strategic recommendations do not normally specifically, you know, uh, mean that they were written specifically for you, but they're good practice. Training is always a strategic, uh, uh, strategic recommendations. So when you tell companies, hey guys, you just need to train your people, don't fire them, okay? Just train them to be better. That's why that's when we have the situation in which you know we, we need to tailgate our way in. Uh, I don't think that you know nowadays clients don't even ask who's the one that you tailgated, or they don't even go to the CCTV and say, hey, you follow this guy, we need to fire this guy, or hey, you social engineer this guy. We had um, we had an assessment, a social engineering assessment, that we were hired by the CEO. Uh, it was a spear phishing attack. And we launched 25 different emails, and the CEO fell through the spear phishing campaign itself. Um, and it was like a, a bonus program. So who doesn't, like, you know, it might be spear phishing, but then I will not get my bonus? Come on. So, and he obviously did not uh, leave his job. Um, so people are, I think that the mentality of firing people because they have done these kind of things is, is going away because we know that, uh, at least in the US, I mean, it's going away. Uh, the, I think that the only person that might get uh, uh, fired sometimes is the, the, uh, the CISO, the Chief of Financial Security Officer, if something really happened. Um, and I think that's why, you know, we're going towards a culture where you're the chief. So because you're the chief, you go when something happened. But the other people, they just remain. Um, that's one. The second one was? Uh, one about uh, salary. Is the clients who are not... Uh, ah, the vulnerabilities the are repeat. You, yeah. yeah, vulnerability repeats. Yeah. So, yeah, so we see that as well. We see that when uh, third parties are involved. Sometimes clients, you know, they know that there's a problem, but they're not the ones that have the ability to fix them. Uh, the world is moving towards uh, contractual agreements that say that we are allowed to test your, your systems, and if we find something, um, you are responsible for fixing it. If not, you will not be able to work with us and things of that sort. It's changing. Clients that don't have that, smaller clients, okay, will still have these problems and we will still see these issues coming up again. That's it. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks again. Thank you, guys.